So thanks, Kim, for being here. Um, I'm just going to do a brief introduction because one of the things that came up for the interpreters was, you know, what does extended year learning look like? You know, what what's the criteria and what does that mean when they're in IEP meeting? So I'm going to let you introduce yourself and you can share your slide and then um, we'll uh, actually upload it to the interpreter playlist on the USBE YouTube. Okay. So thank you. Excellent, thank you for having me. So I'm Kim Fratto and I'm the Director of Special Ed Programs at the Utah State Board of Education. Happy to be here and just go over some of the basic um, criteria for extended school year services that we refer to as ESY. And I am gonna share my screen. So let's see if we can get this up and going. Tell me if you see it and we're ready to go. Yes, we're ready to go. Thanks. Okay, good. So um, extended um, school year services, um, referred to as ESY, um, they are for students um, with disabilities. And so extended school year services are often confused with summer school. Uh, and so I wanna say that right off the bat. Um, ESY is not summer school. Um, they are for, um, it means special education and related services uh, for students um, who have been identified um, with a disability. And they are provided um, for students beyond the normal school year um, or beyond the normal school days of the local education agency. And they're in, um, in accordance um, with the student's IEP, their individual education plan. And they're at no cost to the parents of the student or the adult student with a disability. And they um, also meet the standards of the Utah State Board of Education as outlined in our special education rules. Um, so that's important to, to know, not summer school, beyond the normal school year, and at no cost to this, the parents of the student with a disability or the adult um, student with a disability. All right, so a couple other real important factors about extended school year. Um, it's not pre-teaching or trying to get a head start on what's gonna happen for the upcoming school year. It's not a daycare or a respite type of care for parents of children with disabilities. Um, and it's not like a summer recreation program. And it's not a reason to not provide a free appropriate public education during the regular school year. So for us to say, oh, you know what, we're gonna take a break from this because um, we're gonna be able to catch this student up during ESY. Um, it's, not, it's not for that reason. It's not um, making up for past um, denials of a free appropriate public education. That There's another um, remedy for that under the law and that's called compensatory education or recovery services for education. And that's different than extended school year. So ESY is not required or meant to address the needs of students who did not meet their IEP goals. So that's also sometimes a misunderstanding when students aren't meeting the IEP goals. Sometimes teams will be like, oh, well, we'll do ESY extended school year and try to help them catch up on their IEP goals. That's not the purpose of extended school year. Um, if a student's not meeting their IEP goals, the team should reconvene and look at the data and um, look at why a student might not be meeting IEP goals, adjust IEP goals, maybe adjust services and supports to help students make meaningful um, educational benefit towards those IEP goals. So they're not also, ESY is not designed for students to develop new skills that haven't currently been identified in their current IEP, in their current individual education program. And it, this is important because we're um, still trying to catch up from um, and recover for students that lost um, skills during the pandemic. Extended school year was not design, designed to resolve issues for students that were created um, from learning loss through the pandemic. So what's the purpose of ESY? So it is to ensure that students with disabilities receive a free appropriate um, public education um, and they get services that they need. 
and it's to help um, those students maintain um, skills on their current IEP and, and again, ensure that they receive that free appropriate public education. And specifically so that students don't regress or lose skills. When we talk about, we're gonna talk about regression and recoupment, those are terms in the um, law. And that means regress means lose the skills, recoup means gain them back. Um, so um, specifically it's so that they don't lose a significant amount of skills and level of achievement that they attained prior to coming onto a, a large break, like a large break over like winter break um, or the summer break, um, or a large break in instruction. And um, so we would look at if students need to have um, extended school year. Sometimes students have a large break for medical reasons. So you can collect, teams can collect data over those types of break as, breaks as well and should be collecting data because that would help them to determine um, if ESY services might be needed um, over, a, over say a summer break. So um, again, if students um, lose skills and the team thinks they cannot be retained in a reasonable period of time after traditional instruction starts up again. That's what we would look at with ESY. So um, extended school year services are um, made by the IEP team. So who makes the decision about ESY? They're made by the IEP team and they're determined on an individual basis. And it's if the student, if the the particular student, if the services are necessary for the provision of a free appropriate education for that student. So does the student need these types of services throughout the, um, the summer or throughout a long break, maybe over winter break, do they need to continue receiving services to maintain the skills and um, make um, appropriate um, advancement towards their goals and make meaningful um, progress and have meaningful benefit from their um, individual education program. So um, things that are important to know is the IEP team must provide parents with a prior written notice uh, of a proposal of refusal of ESY services. So if a team feels, if IEP team feels that a student is not gonna be eligible for services, parents have to be provided with a prior written notice. Um, so here on this bullet here, talks about this third bullet down, the indented one, ESY eligibility decisions and prior written notice of ESY programs shall be provided to parents or adult students in sufficient time to permit accessing dispute resolution options of the procedural safeguards in the event of a dispute. And the reason that that's important, and I read it verbatim, is because um, parents have the right to disagree with that decision and they need to have time to, um, to dispute that if they feel like their student needs um, those services. So that is important. So if eligible students, um, if students are eligible, the ESY program must be determined by the IEP team based on students' individual needs. And parents are part of that IEP team. So that's an important piece that um, we need to remember and consider. All right, so some considerations. So how do we determine um, if a student is eligible? So each LEA, local education agency, um, shall ensure that um, extended school year services are available. So LEA can't opt out and say, well, in our, in our um, local education agency or school or district, we don't do ESY. That's not a thing. So just gonna put that out there. <laughs> um, extended school year services have to be provided and they have to be consistent with the rules and they're based on multiple data sources or multiple data points. So um, uh, ESY programs are provided for students in the least restrictive environment. So that's the environment that the student um, is, uh, data shows that the student will best be served in. And ESY teachers and paraeducators must meet USBE and IDEA requirements. And that means that they must be have some knowledge and skills in the areas that they're gonna be serving students with disabilities in. 
That's in both the USBE and the IDEA Code of Federal Regulations. And IDEA is Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So lots of acronyms. I'll try to make sure I define them. Um, so some additional considerations um, that, that we have to think about. Um, limit extended school year services to particular categories of disability. So we can't do that. We can't say that only students with significant cognitive disabilities or really complex disabilities can be considered for extended school year. Um, the law doesn't allow that. We can't unilaterally limit the, the type, the amount, or the duration of services. So every child that um, has to be considered if they're on an IEP, um, if they are eligible on an individual basis for extended school year services. Um, we can't limit the data that we look at and only um, analyze regression and recoupment. So we have to look at multiple factors. So re again, regression is um, how much did they lose and recruitment is how much does it, how long does it take for them to gain it back? So again, we need to look at multiple factors. And um, talking about regression and recoupment. So we talked about can't limit the consideration of only to only regression and recoupment. And we talked about what that means. And it and it doesn't just mean academic. So it does mean behavioral um, or academic um, or both skills. Um, uh, and we look at the level that they're at now and the level that they were at after they had a break and look at those, those data points and um, uh, how much they regress and then how long did it take when they came back to, to gain those skills back. Other things to look at are um, like, are they at a critical learning point? Did, were they like really flat? Did they, weren't they, they weren't gaining skills and then all of a sudden they had to jump up in skills and they're just like have a lot of momentum going on and it was a critical skill and we want to keep that momentum. So that's a piece of data um, that we look at. We don't just look at one thing. So we look at all, we put all the pieces together and, and then the team makes the decision. Is it in this child's best interest to receive extended school year? So um, here, this is some additional factors that came out of the 10th circuit. And that's the circuit that we look to in the state of Utah. So this was a um, some factors that came out of a decision um, that said it's just not regression and recoupment that need to be considered. So um, I thought this was really important to look at because it kind of breaks down all these things that teens should look at when we limit our uh, just, oh, well, you know, they didn't regress as much or they regress, but we think that they recouped in time. Those, those can be kind of um, subjective and not always really objective factors to look at. So the degree of impairment is something to consider. The degree of regression suffered by the child, we talked about that, the recovery time for the regression, so regression and recruitment. This is very interesting, the, uh, the ability of the child's parents to provide the educational structure at home. That is very important to consider when a child is going to go off for a long break. Um, so um, that it's very important that you have open communication with parents, and we're talking with parents about what that looks like when there's a long break at home and what types of supports are um, being provided. The child's behavior and physical problems, the availability of alternative resources, uh, the availability and the ability of the child to interact with children without disabilities. If the only opportunity um, for the child to have those types of interaction is in the school setting, that's something that the school team needs to consider. The areas of the child's curriculum that need continuous attention. Um, so something to consider here is if a child is engaging in, say, a related service like speech language um, therapy, and it's critical for that child's development and to learn to communicate, and a long break is going to really um, impede that learning structure and um, the team is concerned about that, that is something that the team would want to um, think about in addition to the regression and recoupment. And um, if we need to, if, if the team felt like, oh, we, we really need to look at 
um, some continuous attention into this area of speech language therapy right now. We, we think it's really vital at this stage of development. So those are things that the, the team would consider based on the individual student and that individual student's needs. Um, vocational needs, and also whether the requested service is extraordinary for the child's condition as opposed to an integral part of a program for those with the child's condition. So, and again, that came out of a decision from Johnson versus Independent School District and out of the 10th Circuit, which is our circuit. So we pay close attention to those decisions. All right, additional considerations under that same ruling um, are listed here. Um, and again, it's not exhaustive. Um, uh, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, it uh, does state that uh, the individual case analysis should proceed by applying not only retrospective data, such as regression and rate of recruitment, but also include predictive data. So I thought that that was um, something to interesting to think about. And here's the link to the actual case. Um, if you want to, um, as we say sometimes in, in our field, if we want to nerd out and just really get into there and, and read through it, sometimes they're really interesting. Um, and again, it's it applies to this, the specific student's individual situation and what is appropriate for that student. All right. Takeaways on data for um, ESY. Retrospective analysis, like the Johnson case cited, should measure the reduction in skill during breaks in a student's education and the length of time. Um, predictive analysis should be determined from evidence suggesting that a student is at risk or at high risk for experiencing significant regression in a skill and extended time to um, uh, reachieve that previously attained skill. So again, like if they're, you know, coming along and then all of a sudden they have a jump up and they've got that momentum going and then they're going to have a big break, um, that might be predictive analysis that if they don't have ESY at this time, the team might be concerned that um, they, they might have an extended time to regain that skill because they just learned it. And then all of a sudden, boom, we had a break. And so we're not going to have a lot of time to practice it. Um, but again, remembering very importantly that the Johnson case demonstrated that regression and recoupment are not sufficient alone for an ESY decision. It must be a multifaceted um, an analysis of data and an inquiry on that data. Okay, and we released a technical assistance guidance document on ESY in October of 2022, the USBE did, Utah State Board of Education. And here is a link, and I um, just added a new link that does work. And um, you can um, go right to that link and it goes into greater detail um, on all these uh, topics that I covered in this brief slideshow. Uh, if you want to go there for assistance, it's a great resource, this technical assistance document. It's, um, they're not overly long, but they do go into um, more detail. And then they have other resources and links that you can look at and examples. And um, then you can also reach out to us. And then just a couple things to add is we have some queries that we get and some of the things that we have that come into us, we get a lot of questions on. So when we have like frequently asked questions, we like to go over them and, and share out. So some of the questions we get is, well, what is what's wrong with state laws that limit public schooling to 180 days in a year? And that um, can be construed to denial of faith. If you just say, you know what, we're just going to have 180 days in a year and that's it. And you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. And that's how it goes. Well, that's not how it goes under the law. That could be a failure to provide an, um, a free appropriate public education to a student with disability because we're not doing extended um, school year services to meet a student's unique needs. And then another one, what's the matter with uh, LEA who says, we just have a blanket policy in our district and we don't provide ESY, ESY services. We don't do extended school year services. Same kind of thing, denial of faith um, for students who might need those um, those extra services to meet their unique needs, it doesn't fit with what the law says. So we have to be careful there. And then what, what's the matter with LEAs who don't have 
a blanket policy, but have a zero students receiving services. It's like, well, we, we offer it, but we don't really have students who need it. So, you know, we're good. Well, be careful there because that could still be a denial of FAPE. Um, failure to provide extended school year services to any student may mean that you're not individualizing um, to a student's educational needs to meet their unique needs. So you, may, you really want to look at that because um, if you, if you say we provide it, but you don't have anybody that ever needs it, then that could mean that you're not really looking at the um, true unique needs of all students. And you and you might think, oh, well, we, have, we don't have enough students who have severe enough needs. And again, students don't have to have a specific type of disability to qualify for ESY services. So um, just a little caution there. All right. And then if you have further questions, you can reach out to uh, me, Kim Fratto, and then Jordan DeHaan. Um, he was the one that um, put this presentation together um, for, for us here and did an excellent job. And um, he also um, is good to answer questions about extended school year. So thank you for allowing me an opportunity to share this information with you, to share our technical assistance and give you information on um, where you can go to um, get your questions answered if you have them. We uh, love it when you reach out if you have questions and if anything seems confusing um, in the field, um, we like to hear about it so that we can um, help with that if there are questions or concerns. <clears throat> Thanks, Kim. We really appreciate this. So <clears throat> uh, I just have a couple of questions. So if you stop sharing, uh, we can see if I can ask a question that would clarify the situation that interpreters are finding. Yes. So <clears throat> you've explained it really well, and it's the whole idea of based on the unique individual needs of the student. So at an IEP, at the end of a meeting, when the leader, the team uh, leader of the meeting says, your student doesn't qualify for extended uh, services, but doesn't give any explanation, what would be the most important kind of explanation that interpreters could ask the person to clarify? So what could the interpreter do to help the administrator better clarify why uh, the student isn't eligible? So um, that's a really good question. So I think um, what would be helpful is if the administrator says the student doesn't qualify for extended school year services, a good question would be to ask is um, that based on based on what data does the student not qual qualify for extended school year services so that I could explain to the parents. Okay, so that's a great question because then the interpreter has the skill and the question <clears throat> that they can actually support the administrator from for being much clearer but being very specific. Otherwise, when the interpreter turns and says after they look at the parent, and they and the parent doesn't understand uh, what you know what criteria is being used, because what ends up happening and someone actually talked to me about this previously, <clears throat> is that uh, they're actually kind of miscommunicating in relationship to like if a parent says, well, do you mean summer school? And then they say, yes. Okay, well, no. So what would you say to that? If in fact, an administrator says, you know, when the parent asks for clarification and the interpreter asks for clarification <clears throat> and the tendency is to say, Let's say the parent says that, does that mean they can't go to summer school? Yes, I think the tendency is to say yes, because they're wanting to make the communication easier and sometimes things get lost in translation. So I think it's important that we make sure that we're talking about the same thing. And although it might seem helpful to say, yes, it's summer school or it's like summer school, it does lead to further confusion. So I think um, that we need to be clear and and make sure that we are clear that um, extended school year is not summer school. It's services um, 
and it's special education and related services that um, are provided to students with a disability beyond the normal school year. And, and so we need to be clear that it's not summer school. And, and so um, I, I think that um, it's important that um, if, if the, if it's, told to the interpreter by the team that at summer school, I think it's okay for the interpreter to say, my understanding is extended school year is services that um, are attached to a student's IEP, special education services and, and, and related supports, you know, related services and special education that go beyond the regular school year, that it's not summer school. And um, there, and there's criteria that qualify a student for this. And I'd like to be able to explain to the parent more clearly what the criteria is so that they have a better understanding. I mean, it's okay to ask that question. Yeah, so you know, that's a perfect, perfect example because one of the interpreters actually said, you know, uh, that the leader of the team <clears throat> did not really address the criteria. And so, you know, the parent said to the interpreter, well, you know, uh, my other children have benefited from summer school. So why isn't, why isn't this student able to go to summer school, right? And so I think um, the point that you're making is really important for the interpreter to really be more knowledgeable about what recouping and regression means based on multiple data. And the other thing is, I think the, uh, the court decision is really powerful because it talks about other elements that have to be considered. Um, yes. And how new is that? Because I haven't heard anything from interpreters about that even being addressed. Um, let me see. That is not, it's not a new one. It's it's an old one. So it's been around mm -hmm. since 1990. And it's one that we, it, it's been there and we reference it and it's in our technical assistance. Okay, so that that's really important for them to know that this is a longstanding uh, case law that really represents all the ways in which a criteria is used to make that decision. So yeah. that piece is really important. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So do you I have agree. any last uh, last words for our interpreters? Because they're going to be so like incredibly <laughs> thankful when they were talking about this. They were like so stressed out. Well, I just wanna say for one, thank you for reaching out and bringing this to our attention um, that there's some confusion around this. And I think that um, a lot of times when there's confusion, it's just about communication and really making sure that we're clear with the communication. So um, I'm, I'm happy that they reached out and that we um, have the information, we have the technical assistance. And I, I think it's important that um, parents understand what their rights are and one of the things that I think is really important is we don't want parents to think that ESY is summer school and that their that their students aren't eligible for summer school and they don't know why they're not eligible for summer school and that why some other kids or maybe their other children or their neighbor's children are eligible for summer school and then but but my kid can't go to summer school and it looks like that you know that they're being denied something that any other child might be eligible for because extended school year is not summer school is specific to a child with a disability based on that child's specific needs. And it's an individual decision. And it doesn't mean that, I think one thing that's also very important for everyone to understand is just because a student might be eligible for ESY one year, doesn't mean they're ob automatically eligible the next year. Um, it's, it's based on a student's individual needs and that can vary. So a student could be at a point where they're um, got a critical learning point and they have uh, you know, the team's really concerned about regression and recruitment right now of specific skills, but then the next year they're not in that same type of situation. So maybe this year they're eligible, but next year when the team reconvenes and they look at the data, um, the data is not telling them the same thing. So it's individualized um, um, based on the students' needs, their, their current needs, and um, that's important, I think, for the everybody on the team to understand, and it's important to that it can be explained to the parents in their language in a way that they can understand so that they can be part of and engage in that team decision-making process. 
Thanks. So that's really perfect. I want to uh, tell you how much we appreciate your support uh, for the interpreters and the issues that they've been courageous enough to bring up to me, you know, which I think is really important. You know, it goes to your point about there's help available, but if you're not asking those questions, then we can't really uh, point you in the direction for the answers that will make a difference for our students. Yes. So thanks so much, Kim. Uh, I'm actually going to... I'm going to stop the recording and then just have a few comments, personal comments afterward. So okay. again, thank you so much. Thank you.